you have to recognize in most other countries of the world, the non-European countries, only about 3% of the people, 10% of the people have iPhones. Everybody else has whatever cheap phone that they can, can buy that maybe just makes phone calls. <laughs> Imagine that, a phone that just makes phone calls. Okay, so um, it's also an offense to turn down food. If somebody offers you food at their house uh, in many other cultures of the world and you turn it down, then you're, it's kind of a slap in the face. It's, no, you're, I can't eat your food, right? And this is becoming a problem for, um, for Western missionaries. Again, we, we're all so careful with our diets. I'm gluten sensitive. I'm, you know, whatever. And in many cases, those are real sensitivities and in some cases even diseases and they need to be treated as such, right? But in other cases, it's just a preference. Well, I don't really like to drink milk because, you know, whatever. Right? And I, this was difficult for me in Peru because I have a genuine allergy to eggs. And if I eat anything containing eggs, uh, two hours later, I will have stomach cramps and I will be occupying a certain room in your house for a while. <laughs> and it's, uh, it causes pain, right? It's a serious thing. But there were times when I did not feel like I could ask. And I just knew that I was gonna have to suffer the consequences later because I did not feel like I could ask whether the food that I was being offered contained eggs uh, because it would be rude to the host, right? And so we have to be willing to, to flex, right, on, on those kinds of things. Um, eating meat is actually a common area of concern around the world. So many people, many cultures are more vegetarian, Indian culture, for example. Right? You're going to find vast numbers of vegetarians there. So I had an Indian colleague years ago. Did I take him uh, and I wanted to you know, go have lunch with him during the workday? So do you think I suggested my favorite barbecue restaurant? No. <laughs> I love barbecue. If we're going to go out to eat, s suggest barbecue. I'm going to love it. Right? But no, my Indian colleague, I suggested, uh, I think, either an Indian restaurant or an Italian restaurant. Italian's pretty good for having a lot of, you can get a marinara without meat or whatever. Um, and he appreciated that. And at that meeting, I got to understand the, the Hindu concept, because he was Hindu, of gods. And I asked him, uh, as we were eating our vegetarian food, why do you have so many gods in Hinduism? And he explained to me that... The, the concept was that there was actually one uh, master god, right? And that all these other gods were just incarnations uh, in different forms of the one master god. And I said, Sanjeev, have you ever heard that Christians believe that there is one master god who created this whole universe, but there is only one incarnation? of that God. That was Jesus Christ who came to earth to become flesh and blood. And he was blown away. He had never heard that before. How would he have? He was Hindu, right? And he, and he well, I, I will have to think about this, right? Had I, would I have had that opportunity if we'd gone to, uh, if I had not been thoughtful about where we were going, right? Of course not. Um, Mr. Mr. Moody was a banker in Pakistan. This, this story comes from uh, Don McCurry down in Colorado Springs. He has a little book called Tales That Teach. If you're interested in missions at all, I highly recommend it. Wonderful, wonderful stories. But um, Don was eating one time with a Westerner, an Englishman, who ran the bank in the town. And they had just moved into the neighborhood. The banker invited them over. And they sit down at the table, and Mr. Moody offers them pork. Well, they're in a Muslim country. And Don looked up and he saw that in the little window between the kitchen and the dining room, there were two Muslim women, probably the house servants or cooks, who were looking through the window earnestly to see whether or not these new arrivals would eat pork. He also served wine. And so Don McCurry had to tell his English host, I'm so sorry, but we are just here to serve these people, we need to build relationships with them, and so I cannot eat the wine and the pork that you have set before us. And he didn't. He said that very week, the relationships began to open up, and all the neighbors who had previously been distant and untrusting 
began to, to talk with them and they began to build relationships because the word had quickly gotten out, these people don't eat pork. Now, do Christians have the right to eat pork? Absolutely, I believe so. But he restrained that right for the sake of the cross-cultural ministry there. Uh, drink is another thing. Speaking of wine at the table, this one you may find causes problems not even just in, in the third world, but uh, in Europe, for example. So we had one time a Swiss family, a pastor from Switzerland at our house, and it so happened that he was in town on Thanksgiving Day. Also in town were my aunt and uncle who come from Bob Jones University, and they teach total abstinence from alcohol. So we did not have any uh, wine at the table out of consideration, well, I don't drink it either, but <laughs> out of consideration for my aunt and uncle especially. And it didn't even occur to me, this, the magnificent setup that was about to happen, right? So uh, Mr. Berdula from Switzerland sits down at the table, he and his wife, and I can see that they're, they're looking around, they're, they're looking at things. I don't remember what we had on the table, maybe sparkling cider or something like that. And uh, eventually he asks in a very awkward sort of way, um, um, David, would, would it be common for American Christians to have uh, a little bit of wine or something like that with a big festive meal like this one? <laughs> and my aunt and uncle are sitting right there, you know? And so I'm like, well, um, let's say that American Christians have a diversity of opinions on this subject. <laughs> <laughs> and he understood immediately, thankfully. He was a... He was socially pretty clued in, right? So he understood and, and withdrew the question. <laughs> but, but again, right, I, I have a friend, Lyle, um, in Iowa, and he would always have a beer with lunch, but he wouldn't just have a beer with lunch. He was a believer, right? But he would kind of boast in it sometimes, make a, you know, well, I'm so glad we're reformed, we can have a beer or whatever. And it, it became mildly offensive to, to my wife, uh, who grew up in a family that taught total abstinence from alcohol. Um, and so I talked to Lyle and I said, you know, would you just, um, we don't believe that it's wrong for Christians to, to drink, right? But, but it does create just a little bit of a, an offense because it's unfamiliar. This is when we were much younger as well. And Lyle looked at me and he said, David, you will never see beer at my table again. Right? Because he understood Romans 14. He understood that flexibility that he had to give up what he cherished for the sake of not offending a brother. Right? Uh, modesty. So what verse in the Bible tells you that a skirt must be below three inches above the knee? Or the ankle, if you come from a different tradition. Right? Right? So it may surprise you to learn that some cultures have very different standards of modesty. Uh, one that's mentioned in the book is that Fulani men, which I think is African, I'm not sure, they think that the erotic thing is thighs, right? And so they think it's hilarious that American women go swimming covering up their bosom but exposing their thighs. They think that's just strange because like, well, that, what would be the point of that? right? Uh, in terms of modesty. So the word modesty doesn't have a particular, as we read it in the Bible, we're not given any specific standards, right? The word modesty just means you're not showing off if we think about the root of it. So we got to be prepared that in, in other cultures, it may not be. Uh, it's the things that we would consider immodest may not, in fact, be immodest in that culture. Now, there's always going to be lines there. If somebody says, oh, we walk around naked all the time. Okay, that's not modest either. <laughs> we, can, we can talk to the, the Bible speaks to that, right? But what about uh, concepts of, of order that we have here? I'm not, am I still on challenging? No, I'm not. Here, there's the list. <clears throat> all right, concepts of order. So punctuality, um, privacy. Privacy is huge. If you are a highly private person, you're going to have a bad time in 90% of the cultures of the world, right? Um, I remember being, uh, and sorry for a little bit, um, sorry for the, the imagery here, but I remember being in a mall in Peru 
uh, and needing to use the bathroom. And so I go into the men's restroom there and uh, there's the cleaning lady just walking around the restroom, cleaning, you know, doing <laughs> while all the men are doing their thing. And I'm like, excuse me, this is a little weird, <laughs> you know, but to them, it's not weird at all, right? Because they don't have nearly the same privacy culture that we have. Uh, you know, can you give me a chapter and verse on privacy? In some cultures, right, in the jungle or tribes, uh, particularly the missionaries that we read, the people, the natives will just walk into their house without knocking, whatever. They just, because all the houses are open. And so it's just common. You just, you want to see somebody, you just walk into their house. I see Robin smiling over here. Do you have a story about that? <laughs> and I said, actually, she lived in Canada, so she should have known better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in Saudi Arabia, somebody just walked into their house, but they were from Canada, so they should have known better. Yeah, funny. <clears throat> what about uh, egalitarianism, right? So we don't place a lot of importance on hierarchy and, and roles and things. We don't express a lot of formality. Um, especially now, I think this is, this is um, changing even in the last, in my lifetime in America. Uh, but in other cultures, they may have a lot more concept of that. So in Peru, every meeting at a university, we, I did a lot of university meetings that are uh, related to my trade, which is software. And every meeting would begin with the highest person that they could find in the university, the assistant vice provost of whatever, right, to come and give a 10-minute speech welcoming everybody to this occasion and how you're going to learn and grow so much in your academics and careers and be a better citizen as a result and the world was going to be a better place and all of that, right? But that was very important. And if you forgot to invite that person, it would be tremendously offensive you know, to your meeting. And then we come to cleanliness and hygiene. <clears throat> so in other cultures, uh, they simply don't place the same value on the reduction of germs <laughs> that we do here, right? So washing hands is much less common. Uh, in some cultures, there are actually conventions for which hand you should use to shake hands with people because one is the clean hand and the other one is the dirty hand. That's India. So if you think that cleanliness is next to godliness, you're going to have a bad time <laughs> as a cross-cultural missionary in a lot of places. And the book mentions that there's actually some missionaries who have lost their ministries because they were so fastidious in another culture, they were so fastidious about washing hands that it became an offense. That the, the local people were like, well, they must think that we're contaminated or something because they're always washing their hands. And it actually destroyed their ministry. So the danger here is that if we don't treat um, if we don't treat cultural conscience issues with care, we can actually end up converting people to another culture, but not to Christ. Or we just give such offense, right, that they are not interested in our gospel message at all. But even in the most successful case, right, we can just end up converting people to our Western ways. And so we saw this in Peru big time. They have great respect for North, Norte Americanos, right? North Americans. They see the Hollywood pictures. They see what comes off on TV. They think that everybody lives in a 3,600-foot mansion uh, in Beverly Hills or whatever. So there are some misguided notions. But even so, right, it is true that American economic prosperity has been like something the world has rarely ever seen. And, and some indications of that are certainly true that go out to these folks. And so they respect North Americans, and they, they have a great uh, desire to be associated with North Americans. So they will come hear you speak, not because you're speaking about the gospel, but just because you're from America, right? Um, and so you might find people gathering around you 
that aren't really interested in Christ, in meeting a savior, they're just really interested in acquiring the secrets of wealth and power from a more successful culture, right? And so they can easily be convinced, well, you know, if everybody shows up on time, it's better for everybody, it's more orderly, we'll all have uh, greater progress. Um, if, if you are more egalitarian in your approach to things, right, then uh, people are gonna work together better, you're gonna make more money, whatever, right? You can convince people of this, but it's not the gospel. And so we knew a missionary in Peru who had a small church, and I observed after a while that almost everybody there was from an upper middle class, by Peruvian standards, uh, background. They were well-educated people. They would come to church pretty faithfully every week on time. But uh, as I talked with the men, none of them ever talked about the Lord. They just didn't, that wasn't first in their thinking. And I began to realize that I think a lot of the people were there just because they liked hearing the English missionary preach, but the, and they liked his culture because he was very orderly and punctual and, and all these things, right? But it really wasn't, uh, this was, of course, the, the missionary could see this too, and it was a great disappointment to him. Um, but he was also the one who emphasized those values so much that I think it became part of the problem. So uh, are, are people more attracted to the gospel or to, um, to our iPhones and iThings, right? And this is a problem in, uh, in American ministry as well. If you go into the inner cities and you're talking with poorer people, right, there's a lot of people who just desperately want to get out of poverty. And that is their number one goal. And anything that you tell them, they will latch onto as a way to get out of poverty. And sometimes even ministries get confused, and they think that the goal is to get people out of poverty. But that's not the goal, right? The poor we will always have with us. The goal is to lead them to the Savior. If that results in them coming out of poverty as well, that is wonderful, right? But that's not the prime directive. Sorry, trickies. Um, So we have to calibrate our conscience uh, for missions here. And we, to do that, we have to understand that there's really two parts of our conscience. And I'm not making a technical division here, but just saying there's things that, that are part of God's will, right? But then there's also things that are part of our cultural or personal preferences. And so as we go to um, a cross-cultural context, we have to think about, well, okay, maybe, maybe that's not so much part of God's will as I thought. Maybe it's more personal preference. Uh, where do God's moral judgments end and mine begin? So in the last few minutes we have, I want to look at how this worked out in one of the greatest cross-cultural ministries and conflicts that ever happened in the history of the world, and that was between the Jews and the Gentiles, right? There is no greater cultural division which you could imagine. The Jews called the Gentiles dogs. They hated them. They had a special swear word for them, right? The goyim, and they... They despised them. But in the early church, what happens? What happens is that for the first time in history, Jews and Gentiles are coming together to worship the same creator God. And Paul was at the front lines of this, right? Peter and Paul, both of them, were at the leading edge. Uh, and so Paul writes about this looking back. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians 9. First Corinthians 9, and we'll look at um, verse 19 here. I'm going to read with just a few annotations here from the author as well. He says, For though I am free from all, parentheses, all people and their cultures, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. Now listen for this phrase. It's going to happen several times. 
To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not by being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. <clears throat> to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. So do you hear the common thread here? Paul's overall goal was that I might win them for the gospel. Right? And he was willing to discard anything that was not conducive to that in order to win them. So Paul would have had to work out in his own mind, coming from a strict Jewish background and being a Pharisee of Pharisees and observing all the religious traditions of the Jewish people, he has to work out in his mind now what's, what goes from my conscience, what stays in my conscience, and what's missing. So what goes? All the ordinances around uh, eating meat, uh, the different kinds of meat, clean, unclean, all those kinds of things, right? Those are gone from his conscience because Christ said... Uh, by this, Mark says, he made all things clean. And then we have the account with Peter and the, the sheet from heaven and eat pork and all those things, right? So that has to go from his conscience. What's missing? Well, perhaps for Paul, loving your enemies was something that was missing from his conscience. And that had to be, he had to be retrained in that, right? What stays? What stays, presumably all the moral principles that he reiterates several times throughout the New Testament. Right? The things that we, that we mentioned earlier, that don't steal, no adultery. I mean, these are all things he writes about and speaks of. Those things stay in his conscience. So he had to, to wrestle with all these things. And, and if you're going to do cross-cultural ministry, um, you might have to wrestle with uh, those things as well. So we have to calibrate our consciences by the Word and by the Spirit and be willing to discard some of those cultural or personal preferences. So instead of having just one category for right and wrong, so you go to a, a Latin country, and in your mind you say, well, showing up 10 minutes late for a meeting is wrong. It's just in the category of right and wrong. <clears throat> Maybe now you have a different category for family rules versus cultural uh, values versus wisdom issues versus hygiene versus good manners. You might have to to retrain your conscience to the local culture in some of those areas. So all of this, this flexibility for the sake of uh, the gospel, we can wrap up under the umbrella of Christian liberty. And the author gives this definition of Christian liberty, which I really like, so I've put it on a slide here. He says, Christian liberty is the freedom, if you just read down the right side, the freedom to discipline myself to be flexible for the sake of the gospel. So a lot of people, maybe the seat of the pants reaction is Christian liberty is, oh, cool, now I can go do all the things that my parents wouldn't let me do growing up, right? That's not a true understanding of Christian liberty. It's the freedom to discipline myself to be flexible for the sake of the gospel. And where does he get this definition from? He gets it right from the passages we just read. Paul says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself, i.e. I have disciplined myself, a servant to all, <clears throat> that is to be flexible, that I might win more of them. And so I like this definition. Now, lest you think that this was really all about cross-cultural ministry, God has given us a laboratory where we can practice this. 
Even if you're not thinking about cross-cultural ministry as a life calling, you can practice this. In this laboratory where people come together from all different cultures who have different consciences about things is called the church. And the connection that's made here is so fascinating. If you look at Romans 14 and 15, let's go to Romans 15, verse 7. We know what Romans 14 is about, right? That was the passage we've been looking at in the previous chapters, dealing with Christian liberty and how we treat um, our brethren who have different, different views on non-essential things. But Romans 14 doesn't end there. It actually continues into chapter 15. And so in the first two verses here of chapter 15, he says, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength, and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those you who reproached you fell on me. Let's skip down to verse 7. This is really his conclusion of all this argument of Romans 14. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision, the Jews, on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers, and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. Christ was the original cross-cultural missionary. Think about the Christ was not a Jew in heaven. He was the Son of God, right? The Son of God came to earth to live among the people who were, were famous around the world for having the most fastidious, strict culture on earth. He did that voluntarily. And in so doing... He won not only many Jews, but also opened up the gospel to the culture that the Jews was as far apart from the Jews as could be, right? The culture of the Gentiles. And we can be thankful that he did because, uh, and that Peter and Paul carried this on as they were guided by the Word and the Holy Spirit, um, because that's why we're here today, right? Unless you're Jewish, <laughs> which you might be. <clears throat> So bringing in this, this foreign culture of the Gentiles, right, that's, we really have to go back to Scripture and understand, and I think before you go to another country, you have to understand, you are part of a foreign culture. You don't see it that way. You think it's, you think it's normative and right, but actually, right, if you're a Gentile, you're the outsider, right, and God has extended his mercy to you, and therefore you can extend it to others as well. So he so Paul says, kind of concluding all of this argument a couple chapters later in 1 Corinthians 11, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Paul demonstrated his flexibility in numerous cultures, right? And it's why we have Christianity all throughout the world today, in Asia and Africa, all the places that um, the early missionaries went who understood this. And he exhorts us to do the same. So, um, I just want to wrap up the chapter with a couple of, a couple of challenges here. Right? God has given us this laboratory, the church, because he became a servant. So we then likewise are called to welcome and to serve our brethren, whether they're from our culture or from another culture. Right? So people who aren't like us, we're called to welcome and serve them. People who make us uncomfortable, we're called to welcome and serve them. Maybe even people in this body, maybe even people in this room right now who make you feel uncomfortable. You have the biblical right and responsibility to welcome them and to serve them for conscience sake. Uh, maybe people who we want to judge because they're not strict enough. Or people who make us want to roll our eyes because they're not free enough. Right? The apostles served all those kinds of people in the footsteps of Jesus. 
right? Peter, at the command of God, did what would have been horrific and foreign to any Jew. He went and ate pork at God's command. He invited Gentiles into his home, right? He preached the gospel to them and won them at the command of God. And we do all this for the sake of the gospel, just like Jesus did. So I hope you've had fun. I've had fun um, learning about some of these different cultural areas. But I, I want you to take away, let's figure out how to do this even within our body with people who have different views and consciences on things and to, to learn in practice for what we're going to be doing in heaven, I think, which is meeting a lot of different people from a lot of different cultures. Whether any of that will be retained in heaven, I have no idea. It's beyond my pay grade. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the gospel. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for revealing it to us in time, for including even the Gentiles, which is probably all of us in this room, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the example that you have given uh, in Christ of being a servant to all. And Father, we acknowledge that this is foreign to our nature. It's difficult. And we pray that you would give us the strength uh, as we look to Christ to emulate him in this regard and to truly be a servant to all. And that you might bless this uh, to much fruit in the gospel and save many souls through it. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen.